So I'm Saskia and I have uh, worked in the Steiner <coughs> School as a kindergarten teacher and a coordinator and I've also uh, just finished a dissertation on school governance and I'm beginning to be interested, I'm beginning to experiment with sociocracy or dynamic governance. So that's, I think that's enough for you to understand how I got to end up doing this presentation. So I'm a little bit nervous because this is the first time I'm actually doing this, giving a presentation using PowerPoint and then there are all the technical uh, challenges as well. So bear with me. Um, Thank you. So the purpose of this presentation is really um, to share some ideas, mainly some of this is still at the stage of concepts um, based on qualitative research that I've done and a tiny bit of qualitative research that we've managed to do together with John and other people, and then some experience of applying these ideas. Um, presenting it here for me is mainly about networking. It's about entering into a dialogue with other people who might help me and, and John and others so to connect these ideas. So there's, there's some input from Steiner, Steiner's threefolding, um, then there's you, the ICSA conference, and then sociocracy and dynamics of governance, which is actually two words for the same thing, so that we can continue the quest together, I'm hoping. So the reason, I just wanted to say um, why, um, I wonder, actually, um, John, can you hear me? Yes. yes. You were going I to can hear you now, yeah. You were going to say something, you, you were going to say something about your experience in intentional communities. I experienced a number of uh, intentional communities that I've worked with. In fact, one of the original ones is the Eco Village of Loudoun County in uh, Virginia, in the state. Um, and um, my experience with them is that uh, they tend to be um, wonderful places to be. Uh, the governance tends to be a challenge. Uh, if you think of hierarchy and flat organizations as sort of the yin and yang of, of governance, uh, communities tend to be um, the uh, non-hierarchical, and I would observe in these communities a shadow side. There's a shadow side of a hierarchy, there's also the shadow side of an emphasis on flat or non-hierarchical organizations. And we'll be exploring some of that today. Thank you. I'm done. Thank you. So um, this slide shows something that you might uh, come across in a Steiner school. Um, it's, the f it's the festival of St. John and so I just wanted to say why for me the example of Steiner schools is relevant to intentional communities um, because this first um, reason is they belong to what Steiner called the spiritual cultural sphere of society and it might still be a bit vague what that means I'm going to go into that later um, so basically both schools and communities are trying to serve people. Their main purpose is around education or uh, some form of uh, living in community, which is also, it's not a, it's not a commercial or a political goal. Um, schools can really feel like communities to people. Uh, the parents sometimes, after a while, don't know quite whether, whether they've joined the school because they, their children need the education or because they enjoy being in that community. And in science schools especially, there's this strong ethos that binds people together. There's often a common culture. And um, in the case of Steiner schools, uh, the governance experiments have been around working with uh, structures that aren't top-down or power over. So to, ex to kind of explain that a little bit more, uh, Martin Rawson, who was my supervisor and an author and Steiner teacher, Define standard school governance in this way in an article he wrote in Rose, which is a research journal which is peer reviewed but uh, all talking about Steiner education. <coughs> and um, so he talks about a teacher, the teacher's republic. And so Steiner school governance is, is 
functioning in a way that teaches that's that concept of they are in, in working together in a collegiate way. There's uh, ideas of non-hierarchical structures, distributed authority and leadership, and self-organization, so independent from state and corporations, uh, peer accountability and dynamic delegation. So in that way, I felt that's quite close to what a lot of intentional communities are trying to do. So now these three approaches that I've tried to, uh, I'm beginning to kind of put together is uh, the ideas that come from dynamic governance or sociocracy. And to give a very brief definition, this is a governance structure, a proposal for, for governance that combines egalitarian and hierarchical structures. And when I said to John, shall I say hierarchical? He said, yes, use the H word. <laughs> um, so uh, threefolding is this idea that I'm going to explain later um, to do with, uh, um, it's basically it's a, a set of principles that Steiner was beginning to develop. So uh, still at, at a stage where we need to go further and understand what, that, what we can do with that. And then this life and form dichotomy, which is something that I came to when I was analyzing my research data when I did the dissertation on a, a case study on a, on a Steiner school. And I thought, actually, stepping back, there is that if you look at an overall picture, there is something which I've, I've started calling the life form dichotomy. Yeah, I keep doing this the wrong way. So this is um, some of the results, the findings of my dissertation, where I interviewed 14 uh, members of a school community, so including parents, uh, trustees, staff. I didn't interview pupils, because that was more complicated to organize. Um, when people answered, uh, just talked about how their experience was around the school structure, I then later tried to put that into a quantity kind of measuring what that meant and I thought okay there are roughly three categories people are either positive or they have a mixed view or they really <coughs> have a sort of it's it's not going very well for them <coughs> they're sharing lots of negative experiences so in this case study of Steiner school I discovered that half of the people had that so half of the 14 uh, people I interviewed had a, a negative experience of the school structure and then I went and asked them about decision making. So I figured, in a way, I, I need to ask about these two different areas. They're involved as a teacher, as a parent. So they have like a primary task or a primary involvement. And they also are involved in wider school decisions. So I asked them about their primary task first. And I felt there was this, this po these two poles of when you have decision making, I figured if there is a lot of inclusion, there might be less effectiveness. So I asked them, how much do you feel your voice is included? Um, and how effective do you feel decision making is? And here, there's quite a lot of a sense of people's voice is included. I mean, this is also, for instance, the teacher making decisions about their own classroom. Um, and here, the effectiveness um, is still quite present, but it's significantly less than the inclusion. And then in wider school decisions, um, still half of the people felt that their voice was included, but the effectiveness has gone down quite significantly. So, um, then I just, this is just a little bit of to give, you don't need to read this, but it gives you a sense of um, how, what a variety of decision-making modes people were referring to. So I asked them, what do you think is the main decision-making mode in a school? And in the primary task, they said things like, <coughs> if, if you're empowered, then being directive works best. <coughs> Some said it's consensus, benevolent di dictatorship, um, or a show of hands. And so there was a huge variety here of, in one school, of how people perceive decision making. And then in the wider school, um, people said things like, 
if we make decisions, so when I say wider school decisions, it's something like, do we extend <coughs> the provision? Do we add a kindergarten? Do we add an upper school? That kind of big decisions, uh, which in this school tended to be put to everyone, so in, in some form. Um, some people said it's haphazard. It's just an accumulation of opinions. People keep sharing their opinions. Uh, there's undue process, and then again the word consensus coming up here. Okay, so then I took a step back and tried to like, say what can I make of all these interviews, and I found I, I started to to work with this idea that there was life on the one hand and form on the other hand. Oops. So um, what I found was that in that case study, possibly there was a lot of initiative, creativity, um, inclusion was valued, there was a lot of warmth and care in the relationships, um, openness and communication, so that's, that's kind of one poll. And then in terms of the form poll, um, people were talking about disempowerment in lead roles, so you can see the kind of strangled conductor. Um, these pictures are actually uh, metaphors that people were using in the interview, so I tried to find pictures to, the, to go with the metaphors. Um, unclarity of communication channels, that if there is a change made in the structure, that that's not necessarily transparent to everyone or reviewed um, to see whether it works. Uh, that there are long, inefficient decision-making processes. So this is a little decision trying to find a home. <laughs> so that's some, some <coughs> metaphor somebody used. And there's a lack of unified direction, uh, so no strategic plan, lack of collective vision around social change, and a high stress level, high stress levels of staff. So when I put, then I kind of thought, okay, how to illustrate this life form dichotomy. So I thought if you have the, the, it's not a problem, there should be a balance between those two. But if it goes into the extreme, then you have vague agreements, lack of unity, lack of clear direction, length of decision processes, so lack of effic efficiency, effectiveness. And uh, with extreme form, you would get a lot of bureaucracy, formal relationships, inflexibility, and top-down power over structures. So I try to make an analogy with, with um, just to, to give a sense of form as not necessarily being like this, but if you find, oops, if you find more form, because that's the issue in, I think, in Steiner schools and in the uh, communities is how do you get people to accept a bit more form? So maybe the analogy to a garden is useful because you're bringing form into, this is Applecross, middle of the north of Scotland, uh, actually on the west coast, and this is, um, this is nature uh, as it develops on its own. Okay, so another analogy there, which probably I'll just skip because I'm getting to five minutes. Um, perceived structure, this was, uh, these were the other findings from, the, from my research, that, that people had very different views of what their school structure looked like. It's very creative. <laughs> and so this is now this three-folding idea, which I'll have to explain very briefly. So Steiner, um, saw so that you had these three areas in society based on analogy to the human body, the head, the heart, and the metabolic limb system. So in the political, legal, financial sphere, the cultural sphere, which is where schools and communities find their base, and the economic sphere, you'd have these three different qualities. And they're, they're basically the French Revolution qualities that instead of applying them to the whole of society, you apply them to one sphere mainly, and you get a different picture. So at the moment, if you apply freedom in the, in the economic sphere, um, it kind of gets, I think, what you get with capitalism. If you apply um, 
equality in the cultural sphere, you might get what communism was doing with art. So it's, it's a very, very quick uh, run through of this. But this is now, the idea now in, in this school, which I have to introduce, uh, this is Ria, Ria Gill's book. She's the director of the High Mowing um, Steiner School in the States. And this is their structure now, based on this threefolding idea, together with the dynamic governance, governance principles. So they, John and Ria are actually working on this. John, do you want to say something about the threefolding? Can you hear me? Um, yes, I can. Um, I, I think that what we've done in the work on the threefolding is make sure that the pedagogical sphere uh, is respected but does not um, ignore the other two spheres so that there's a balance. In a lot of Steiner schools, they, the emphasis is completely on the pedagogical to the, and the, the ignoring the other two spheres. Um, and the, that tends to happen because of the fear that the pedagogical area, the, the, the blue sphere there, will be somehow dominated by the other two, but it, it tends to swing the opposite way. So we've tried to balance it. Great. So, um, next slide. So then uh, Ria has gone as far as actually taking every school sphere apart and threefolding that again. So again you have like a head part, a heart part, and a limb part. Um, so, and again, I don't have time to go into this but more in detail, but that's, that's really the what we're working with and trying to understand better and how we can apply, but I, f I feel that Ria has done uh, a significant job there. They've also used, so this is more a dynamic governance circle structure view, where they're trying to combine these, these so th this is again the pedagogical, cultural, spiritual sphere, in the middle the heart, the right sphere, so it's all about interrelationships, and this is about the economic sphere. So then, just quickly to say, we, there was a little survey done by John and Ria about how people felt in that school, having had about a little over a year of dynamic governance introduced. And so oops, these are the, some of the comments. There's a greater sense of safety in faculty. Um, meeting structure is highly effective. People can't use their power. So it's quite positive, although there is still a lot to tweak and people are still learning it. Um, then what changes has dynamic governance brought to your school? So there we focused, the, the survey focused on dynamic governance, so change in morale. Um, the red ones are more on the negative side, more as being accomplished, uh, less complaining, fewer personality conflicts. People feel actively heard, um, <coughs> fewer groups gather for whisper sessions. I'm nearly done. Yeah. So this is an example of uh, how an intentional community could set up a structure that is using these, uh, this, uh, the idea of, of dynamic governance this time. We haven't yet got anything on adding the threefolding idea in. And this one as well. This is a community, a co-housing community in Holland who have just introduced this. And that's um, intentional community, some comments from people who are working with dynamic governance in intentional communities. So again, uh, brings a calm in the group and less emotional outbursts, I like that one. And the conclusion is, so, so, so basically bringing these three approaches together is what we're trying to work with. Um, the experience shows that we have more effectiveness, equality and transparency, and of course further research is needed to to, to keep on going and gather more experience and continue to develop the concepts. So that's it. Thank you, Saskia.